The Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers presents the 1994 Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecture Series. Each year, one outstanding individual is chosen to share their innovations of groundwater hydraulics to schools and universities throughout the world. This year, the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers is honored to present the 1994 Darcy Lecturer, Dr. Edward Siddiqui from Waterloo University in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Siddiqui is internationally known and was specifically chosen for the enthusiasm and energy he inspires through his lectures. Our 1994 Darcy Lecture focuses on contaminant migration in complex structured porous and fractured porous geological media, a simulation perspective. And now, presenting from the Ohio State University, Dr. Edward Siddiqui. Maybe I could uh, perhaps begin by saying that the research at the University of Waterloo is, is uh, multifaceted, involving things from groundwater resources to isotope studies, uh, and with particular emphasis on groundwater contamination. And early in my career, when I began uh, uh, my master's degree, in fact, uh, I became interested in both groundwater modeling and uh, dispersion processes and how heterogeneity influences uh, the spreading of and evolution of contaminant plumes. Now, the, uh, the field research in contaminant hydrogeology involves a variety of experiments, and many of them that we're doing now are geared towards groundwater remedia remediation, bioremediation, and the numerical models which we develop uh, are often used to design and plan the experiments. And the experiments are performed, and oftentimes we, uh, because very complex processes are involved, observations are made in which the model simply does not uh, capture them. So in, that, in those types of situations, the experiments are driving model development. On the other hand, when we develop some of these models that involve coupled processes, um, we note from the model response uh, certain behaviors which have not perhaps been uh, detect detected in field observations or laboratory experiments. And in that case, the modeling drives the field or lab experiments. So there is a, a symbiotic relationship between the field and lab research and the numerical modeling efforts. So in my talk here, it will primarily, primarily be geared towards uh, the results from a, a series of numerical experiments we have performed involving both fractured porous media and heterogeneous sandy type deposits. As a scientist studying uh, groundwater problems, I like to use numerical models in order to understand how interacting processes and heterogeneity uh, combine to affect plume evolution over field uh, transport scales. And we like to gain insight into the system response and at the field scale try to understand with the models what are the controlling processes. And that's very relevant because when one goes to the field in order to measure values of certain parameters, you want to measure the values of parameters which are the most important ones. And those which are of secondary importance perhaps place less emphasis on measuring those parameters. And establishing cause-effect relationships is, is also very relevant. And finally, because we, as everyone recognizes, geologic media are very heterogeneous. And because of geologic uncertainty, there is obviously going to be, in many cases, a considerable degree of uncertainty in the model predictions. And I generally like to avoid the word prediction. Perhaps forecasting is a is a better terminology to use. In numerical weather forecasting, for example, um, when you look at the, the news in the evening, the uh, weather, they will give you a probability that it's going to rain tomorrow or uh, a temperature range. And I think models perhaps should be used in that context to, rather than in a uh, yes-no type uh, uh, scenario. Now, uh, as I mentioned, my talk is divided into two broad categories, one which involves fractured media and the other which involves heterogeneous porous sandy type aquifers. And I have uh, in the area of fractured transport uh, several topics which I'll cover, one is which involves 
the transport of contaminants through a fractured clay into an underlying aquifer, which is a common geologic uh, setting in glaciated regions. I will very briefly touch on variably saturated flow in uh, fractured media, and in particular, I will sh attempt to show you what a water table might look like in fractured uh, materials. And finally, I'll touch on dense brine migration in fractured uh, forest materials. In the area of sandy type uh, deposits, uh, I will talk about non-reactive and reactive solute transport. And by reactive solute transport, what I mean is a, a contaminant which partitions from the aqueous phase onto the solid phase, in other words, sorption. And finally, uh, I will talk about denapple removal by air sparging and vacuum extraction. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the acronym, DNAPL uh, stands for dense non-aqueous phase liquids. And a common example is chlorinated solvents such as tri trichloroethylene or perchloroethylene. And these chemicals are sparingly uh, soluble in water, denser than water, and they can sink past the water table as they are spilled and come to rest perhaps on low permeability layers and form pools that act as long-term uh, zones of groundwater contamination. So I'll begin with uh, groundwater flow and solute transport through fractured clay aquitards, and my, my colleague at the University of Wir University of Waterloo, uh, Dr. John Cherry, has been studying clays, I guess, since the late 60s when he was still at the University of Manitoba. And he has come to the conclusion from his field studies that the safe assumption to make is that all clays contain fractures. And the question then becomes, what is the relevance of perhaps several or a few sparse fractures that penetrate vertically through an aquitard? And can these fractures act as conduits to contary to carry surface contaminants uh, down to an underlying aquifer and then potentially contaminate it. So this is the scenario which I was interested in a couple of years ago and some papers were written uh, and published, I guess, two or three years ago by former students and John Cherry. And we have a fractured clay aquitard s situated on top of a sand and gravel aquifer. Um, and this aquitard contains primarily vertical fractures. In the near surface zone, where it's, which is weathered, the fractures are commonly spaced on the order of centimeters to perhaps a few tens of centimeters. And as one proceeds deeper, the fractures become more widely spaced. Now, if we have a waste facility located near the surface, then if we ha and also if we have a few uh, vertical fractures which fully penetrate the aquitard, then there is a propensity for contaminants to migrate downward to these fractures by advection if there is a downward hydraulic gradient and perhaps uh, contaminate the lower aquifer which may be used for water supply. In the absence of uh, uh, processes such as diffusion from the fracture into the adjacent matrix, that, that is considering only advective transport of contaminants, and you take a typical fracture aperture in these clays, which is perhaps on the order of 25 or 30 microns in thickness, it can take on the order of days to perhaps a few weeks for a contaminant to travel downward into the lower aquifer. On the other hand, when you do account for the process of matrix diffusion, uh, which acts as an attenuation process that reduces the solute or chemical flux along the fracture, then the residence time of the chemicals within the aquitard can be increased by many orders of magnitude. So I've indicated here sort of typical transport times, uh, perhaps tens to hundreds of years in the clay matrix because transport in that zone is going to be primarily by molecular diffusion. In the fractures, we have transport times on the order of days to weeks, and then the aquifer on the order of months to years. And those tremendous contrasts in time scales also present uh, difficulties with regard to obtaining accurate numerical solutions to the problem at hand. And we have spent considerable effort on developing numerical techniques to solve scenarios such as this. And lately, we have developed uh, a fully three-dimensional numerical simulator, which can also account for unsaturated conditions within the aquitard. And that model was developed by a former uh, PhD student of mine by the name of Rene Therrien. Uh, 
So just to recap, the issues that we're interested in is the importance of sparse vertical fractures connecting a near surface contaminant source to an underlying aquifer. Uh, do we need to account for matrix diffusion as an attenuation mechanism, or is it something which is relatively unimportant in, as uh, to slow down the rate of migration of the contaminants in the fracture? And then there's the issue of prediction uncertainty. <coughs> now, you can imagine that if we have uh, vertical fractures which have an aperture on the order of 20 or 30 microns in thickness and they're spaced on the order of 5 or 10 or 15 meters at depth, then these features will be extremely difficult to find in uh, site investigations. Now, just to give you a kind of an idea of what a fracture of that aperture, how big it is, the average thickness of a human hair is about 25 or 30 microns. So we're looking for very, very small features. And if they cannot be, be found by standard uh, uh, site investigation techniques, then any kind of prediction is going to be extremely uncertain. Uh, just before I show you the uh, numerical computations and the results for a scenario, as I've just shown, uh, the model which we have developed uh, has some very special features in it which allows one to solve with considerable accuracy and speed the governing equations. As I mentioned, the model handles variably saturated uh, flow in fractured uh, systems, so we must solve a nonlinear uh, flow equation ref known as Richard's equation. Um, in order to solve that accurately, we use mass balance or mass conservative control volume finite element techniques or finite difference. And because of the strong nonlinearities, we use a robust newton raphson iteration technique. Um, in order to speed up the computations, we use an adaptive time-stepping procedure where when the response slows down, we use very large time steps. And if we, for example, turn on a well, the model detects that and begins to use very small time steps automatically. And when you're solving discrete fracture problems in three dimensions, very often the finite element or finite difference grids that one ends up with contain perhaps a quarter of a million uh, unknowns or grid points up to a half a million grid points. And that can require a great deal of computer uh, execution time. Now, in order to shorten that execution time, we spent a great deal of effort in our research in developing very highly efficient conjugate gradient-like uh, matrix solvers to solve these very large sparse matrix uh, equations. And in this particular model, we use a scheme called orthomin acceleration. Also in the transport problem, um, we are fully accounting for processes such as matrix diffusion. We are accounting for fluid leakage between the fractures and the, and the matrix. And for transport, we use a Galerkin finite element technique or optionally a control volume uh, finite element technique or optionally finite differences. Um, in order to conserve memory, we can uh, switch from finite element to a seven-point finite difference. It also increases execution speed, uh, and it uses general time weighting. And like the flow model to which it is coupled, it uses adaptive time stepping and the orthomin iterative sparse matrix solver. Now, let me turn to the example for which I would like to show you some results. Um, it is comprised of a fractured aquitard situated on top of a sand and gravel aquifer. The aerial dimensions of the model domain is 90 meters by 90 meters. The aquitard itself is 10 meters thick, and the aquifer is 3 meters thick. I sh I've shown here in a schematic fa fashion the distribution of the fractures. They're primarily vertical fractures with some horizontal fractures near the surface. We placed a waste facility near the surface, and there are several vertical fractures which fully penetrate from the base of the waste facility to the aquifer uh, aquitard uh, boundary. Now, <clears throat> uh, we have solved this problem in a variably saturated mode, and I will later, uh, once I show you the type of plumes that develop, show you what the water table might look like. And I'll show you what that water table look, will look like if we were to install, for example, a pumping well here in the aquifer uh, in, in an attempt to remediate the contamination. This particular problem was discretized with 100 and 
are roughly 150,000 nodes in the grid, and the CPU time to solve for the variably saturated transient flow and solute transport took on the order of about 10 hours on an IBM workstation, which is relatively quick. Now, this is the ISO surface of the 0.01% relative concentration after a period of 3,000 days, which is roughly eight and a half or nine years. And we can see here the waste facility located near the surface. This boundary is the aquifer aquitard boundary. And we can see that where there were vertical fractures located below the source, the contamination has followed these fractures and has entered into the aquifer and has formed these finger-like plumes, which are now migrating horizontally in the aquifer. And they're very thin plumes, which are hugging the uh, lower surface of the aquitard. Now, a 0.01 relative concentration may seem like a low value, but if you had in the source, for example, a chemical such as TCE, trichloroethylene, which has a solubility of about 1,100 milligrams per liter, then 0.01 of that is about 11 milligrams per liter, which exceeds the EPA drinking water standards for that chemical by several thousand times. So these red zones in here would be heavily contaminated with regard to TCE. And that took only a period of about, as I mentioned, 3,000 days. On the other hand, if one was to ignore the presence of the fractures, then downward transport through the aquitard would be controlled primarily by molecular diffusion because of the low hydraulic conductivity of the aquitard. And if you make a diffusion calculation, it literally takes uh, on the order of centuries for the contaminant to migrate from the base of the waste facility to the aquifer aquitard interface. So that gives you an idea of the role that these very uh, sparse and very thin fractures can play on contamination. And as I mentioned, they're essentially impossible to detect in the field by most f standard field investigations. Now what I'll show here is a horizontal slice just about a meter below the waste facility. Um, here's the waste facility bounds are located here and you can see the trace of some of these fractures that intersect this plane and wherever there is a yellowish region that's where the con concentrations are higher because that's where a fracture is located and a feature to note is that there is considerable matrix diffusion from one fracture to the next adjacent one uh, because after a period of 3,000 days and we are very close to the base of the waste facility. So it's almost acting like a homogeneous porous medium uh, just below the waste facility itself. Now when we look at a horizontal slice uh, through the domain, right at the aquifer aquitard interface, now we see those streaking plumes that are moving from left to right through the aquifer. And again, you can see the trace of the fractures that happen to fully penetrate the aquitard. And this, these concentrations are on the order of about 0.01 relative values. And this is significant, I think, from a monitoring point of view, uh, because if one was to place a monitoring well at this location and take a groundwater sample, you would most likely conclude that the aquifer is heavily contaminated. And if one was to place a monitoring well, let's say, at that location, one would conclude that it is not contaminated uh, because of the irregular shape of this plume. And consequently, I would think that monitoring and, and attempting to interpret the uh, behavior of this plume would be complicated because of the, these fractures are acting like discrete line sources for groundwater contamination. And I mentioned that I wanted to show you the shape of the water table. Um, it doesn't show up extremely well in this slide here, but here's the, wet, the placement of the well, and we pumped this well at a rate which was sufficient to just slightly desaturate this confined or partially confined aquifer. And we can see how the water table has been depressed within the fractures that are located near this zone of pumping. In fact, it takes very little water to be extracted from the fractures in the aquitard to cause this tremendous drop in the water table. If you imagine a, a fracture which is on the order of 10 or so meters by 5 or so meters in aerial or, uh, extent and has a thickness of only 30 microns, literally it takes only a one or two thimblefuls of water to cause this sudden drop in the water table within the fractures. In the clay matrix blocks adjacent to the fracture, it remains saturated, however. So you can imagine if, if you were instrumenting this pump test and 
there were uh, certain wells that intersected fractures, you could perhaps see very sudden drops in the, the water levels in the wells. Other uh, monitoring wells located in the matrix blocks would respond very little. And it, again, could be very difficult to interpret the hydraulic response of this aquitard because of the presence of the fractures. Now, lately we've begun performing some uh, risk type modeling uh, work in order to quantify uh, the probability or chance of contaminating aquifers underlain by fractured aquitards. And this is one result that I'd like to show you. Uh, again, it's a fractured aquitard overlying an aquifer, and the boundary is through here that separates those two units. And uh, we're using a Monte Carlo approach in order to compute the probability that the concentration exceeds some critical value, such as a drinking water standard, at all points in the domain for every value of time, in this case, 250 years. So what we do is, given statistics on the distribution of the fractures, and these were drawn from the PhD thesis of uh, Larry McKay, who did his PhD with John Cherry, we implemented these statistics in the model and then could generate multiple realizations of that aquitard and each time solve the groundwater flow equation, then the solute transport equation, and if we do this enough times, we can actually estimate these probabilities. And I find that they are very useful, in fact, probably much more useful than predicting some average concentration plume, because if we take a point located here, for example, uh, that would suggest that there is something on the order of a 50 or 60 percent chance that we will exceed this concentration at this point in time. And if that was uh, too high a risk to accept, one could perhaps then do some engineering of the waste facility around the source and uh, repeat the simulation and determine whether or not these, these probabilities have declined to an accept acceptable level. And ultimately, one could uh, incorporate this in a kind of a raw risk and cost benefit type analysis. So just to summarize this aspect of the talk, I think we came to the conclusion that if we have a few sparse vertical fractures which fully penetrate an aquitard, then they can lead to significant contamination of an underlying aquifer. Um, I think it's fair to say that matrix diffusion can never be neglected, certainly not in clays, and I believe not even in crystalline type rocks over time scales of tens to hundreds of thousands of years, which is relevant to the uh, radioactive waste disposal program. And I think it's also fair to say that prediction uncertainty is likely to be very high. Now, let me touch on the problem of dense brine migration in fractured media. And this is very recent work that we actually conducted within the past uh, four or five months. And it was initiated from a master's thesis by a student of mine by the name of Steve Shukazi, who studied the analogous problem of dense organic vapor migration in unsaturated porous media. Now, what we were interested in was the effect of the uh, density of the uh, groundwater on plume complexity, how important is fracture aperture and fracture spacing, and do we develop density-driven convection cells within fracture networks? And there has not been a great deal of work uh, that I've seen in the literature that deals with density-driven uh, contaminant transport in fracture networks. So this is very much exploratory research. Um, I'll show you a couple of examples, and these examples involve not fracture networks, but just simple vertical fracture systems in order to focus on uh, elucidating density effects. And we'll, we'll examine two scenarios, one which involves very widely spaced fractures, another which involves closely spaced fractures, and uh, in both cases, uh, we'll assume that the matrix uh, has clay-like properties and there will be no ponding on the brine surface. So no externally applied hydraulic gradient. Now here are some of the results for the widely spaced fracture scenario. The fracture passes through the center. There's only a single fracture. And I'm showing three scenarios here, uh, each with different aperture. So here's the upper one, an aperture of 10 microns middle one with 25 micron aperture, and the lower one with a 50 micron aperture. Uh, there is no, as I mentioned, externally applied hydraulic gradient. 
the equivalent freshwater head is zero across the top and zero across the bottom in all cases. And the relative density of this brine compared to water is 1.2. So it is very dense solution. So it is the density term that is causing any migration that might occur down the fracture in this scenario. Now when we have a very small aperture, that fracture is actually very hydraulically inactive and we do not see any density induced advection along that fracture. In fact, diffusion can explain the concentration profile there. On the other hand, when we increase the aperture to about 25 microns, now we see that the density term that appears in the flow equation is driving some of the flow down the fracture and we see some diffusion laterally into the adjacent porous matrix. And again, when we increase the aperture to 50 microns, more pronounced density induced advection along the fracture. And one characteristic to note in these scenarios is that we don't see any instabilities that are developing, even though this is an unstable situation where we have a dense fluid sitting on top what is initially a freshwater uh, solution. Now let's turn to the case where we have the closely spaced vertical fractures. And here are the fractures, they're one meter apart. And again, there's no externally applied driving force, so it's only density that's causing the fluid to migrate vertically. And the aperture in all cases is 50 microns, and we're looking at the plumes at one year, two years, and five years. And what we notice is that very early time, the plume is beginning to migrate down each of the vertical fractures preferentially, but more so in certain fractures than other fractures. And when we look at it at an intermediate time of two years, we can see that there is, there is considerable migration along every second fracture and very little migration in the intervening fractures. Uh, now, what we think is occurring is that we have this dense brine in this fracture and in this fracture, which increases the pressures within the porous matrix adjacent to it, and that's causing uh, convection cells to be established within the porous matrix. And that's causing groundwater to be driven upward in every alternate fracture. And if we look at the plumes at five years, which happens to be the, about the time when the whole system comes to steady state, you can see a clearly defined plumes along every second fracture and upward flow and fresh water in the intervening fractures. And this has some implications with regard to uh, perhaps monitoring because at least at Waterloo, what we have done when we have investigated sites that have contamination and these are uh, sites where there are clays and fractures are known to exist, we take angle cores uh, because one would logically use angle cores to increase the probability of finding fractures. And you bring the core back to the field and you section the core and you squeeze the pore fluid out and you make a concentration determination. And wherever you detect high concentrations, one comes to the conclusion that there must be a fracture nearby. And where there is very low concentrations, the natural thing to conclude is that there are no fractures located nearby. Well, when we have the, the situation of a dense fluid moving and confection cells being established, that rule cannot be applied. Because here we have uh, a fracture located, but there is very low concentrations. <clears throat> so on the basis of this rather preliminary study, and we have looked at uh, complex fracture networks, but they don't illustrate anything beyond what I've, I've shown here or the point I wanted to make here. But we've concluded that if you have very small apertures on the order of 10 or 20 microns, then uh, density induced advection is really not very important simply because these small fractures are hydraulically inactive. On the other hand, when the aperture is about 30 or 50 microns and greater, then density uh, can become a significant driving force uh, within these fractures and one can establish complex and probably unpredictable convection cells. And then finally, zones of low pore water concentration may not be indicative of the absence of nearby hydraulically active fractures. Okay, now I'll, I'll move on to the topics related to groundwater flow and transport in heterogeneous sandy type deposits. And I'll, I'd, I'd like to contrast the evolution of a non-reactive plume versus a reactive one. And in this